TNT. Were you the editor on our manuscript too? Shuffling Nicky Sands, what? Welcome, everybody. Good to see everyone tonight. I'm Mark Nolan, Vice President of Wichita Audubon Society. Before we get going with the talk tonight, just a couple of announcements about upcoming field trips. Um, we have a bird walk at Chaplin Nature Center, or a field trip to Chaplin Nature Center on the 18th of May. And then we also have our extended field trip, which I hear apparently may still have one spot open. I think it's got a slot or two open there. Or two to Nebraska. Putney, Rancher, Niagara. At the end of May, <laughs> on the 29th, if anybody's interested. And of course, there's always the second Saturday bird walks here at the Nature Center. So we'll have one of those coming up in May as well. It's migration season. So lots of things changing with birds coming back and forth. And also, we'll have a talk in May. Our May monthly meeting will be a talk by Liz Walker, the naturalist at the Chaplin Nature Center. So tonight, we have Chuck Adi talking about. The setting we're here to announce Birdathon. Birdathon. He's spinning a list around. So if anybody's interested in finding Birdathon for the tagging team, contact her. I'll have a team, and I'm not sure if Chaplin is doing a team. So usual donors. See how many species we can see. All right. So tonight I think we have an exciting talk. Chuck Adi is going to be talking about bird distributions in Kansas. A little bit about Chuck, if you're not familiar with him. Chuck has recently retired from a career of over 40 years as a county extension agent for Geary County. He grew up on a family farm in York County, Nebraska. Chuck received his bachelor's in agronomy crop production and master's in agronomy, plant breeding and genetics from the University of Nebraska. As Gary County Extension Agent, Chuck had the sole programming responsibilities for agriculture, horticulture, and natural resources for Gary County, Kansas. Chuck is past president of the Kansas Ornithological Society, KOS, served as the KOS newsletter editor for over 12 years, and currently serves as secretary of the KOS and the Kansas Birds Record Committee. He also served as chairman of the Kansas Non-Game Wildlife Advisory Council. Chuck has co-authored two books about Kansas birds. When not involved with KOS, he spends his time gardening, traveling, cooking, working with amateur radio, and bird watching, sometimes also with KOS members. <laughs> Welcome, Chuck Adi. distributions. We're going to take a look about, does anybody really know what's going on? <laughs> no. And, and that's exactly correct. No, we don't. See a disclaimer. I'm not aware. I don't know play one, but I've got to have a disclaimer. Bird populations are in a constant state of flux. Always have been, always will be. What follows is a little bit of how we got to where we are today and, and some of the challenges that I see, because it's an absolutely fascinating topic. Um, there's so much that we don't know about birds in Kansas and birds in the world, and that's why we need to keep studying them. Our historical knowledge of birds in Kansas is a little bit limited. I mean, we, we have archeologists that have done indigenous tribal cities and campsites and have found burned bones of birds, and they know that they were being eaten the written history, we know Lewis and Clark came through, Pike came, a lot of early explorers came through. A lot of the early army settlements would have surgeons who were supposed to be doctors, but they'd also go out and look at the plants and the animals and like, so we got bits and pieces, but a, a cohesive bird list didn't really happen until snow came along in, in 1872. Damn it, 
University of Kansas, um, and put together the first list, 282 species. Basically, just what he saw, just a couple of very basic things about it. Well, Snow went on to do other things, and, and Colonel Goff came and kind of took that position at the University of Kansas. In 1883, he, re he published this uh, Birds of Kansas, kind of updated what Snow did, was up to 320 species in it. And then, of course, in 1891 was the massive tome that came out, A History of the Birds of Kansas. Fascinating to read. Lots of information in it. It had photos of museum maps. It's just like it was in a, in a museum exhibit and photos and identified, black and white photos, obviously. 335 species, lots of detail, a lot of detail about where they were found in the United States, North America, and to some extent in Kansas. Absolutely fascinating to go back and read that. Then we hit this period of about 50 years and there wasn't really much being published. Arthur Goodrich published in, 18, in 1945, Birds in Kansas, it's a State Department of Agriculture uh, publication. Kind of a recap of what the others had already said. Some entertaining reading, as he talks about good birds and bad birds. He never really said how many species, never really provided a list. It was just an accounting of, wh of what a lot of the others had seen. Dick Johnson came along, 1960, and then revision in 1965. Now we're starting to get someplace. Dr. Johnson was also at, at University of Kansas, 383 species. He started to have a little bit more detail. He had dates for egg laying for the nesting species, dates for migration. He had a general location and habitat. And for some of the rare species, he would say, we have specimens in the collection from such and such a county. So we're getting a little bit further along. But you know, if you wanted to know, if you wanted to look at a range map to see where these birds were in Kansas, you were stuck looking at one of the national maps. So you've got you know, a, a map that's probably two inches by two inches maybe, and Kansas is maybe a quarter of an inch, by, and you're trying to figure out, am I in the area where that bird might be seen? So it was really frustrating. Fortunately, things are getting ready to change. 1989, Max Thompson, Chuck Ely, Birds in Kansas, Volume 1, The Non-Pastoring Species, followed three years later, later by Birds in Kansas, Volume 2, The Pastoring. And finally, we have the infamous and classic and well-known dot map. Finally, we could see where were they being seen in Kansas? Where had they been seen in Kansas? Still not a range map per se, but you had a pretty good idea. A lot more detail also on the natural history of the birds. Year-round residents, migrants, transient, vagrants, rare uh, dates for when they were being, when they were nesting and so forth. Was at Fort Hayes State for years. He had three ring binders for every county with collections of the information that he had received or that he had himself had, had observed. And Max Thompson and him worked together on this birds in Kansas and Max started to develop a database. Marvin Schwilling with whatever wildlife and parks was called in, in the early years um, was doing a lot of stuff on birds too. The three of them through much of the 50s, 60s, and 70s were basically the Kansas Bird Records Committee. They were the deciding factor on what records were accepted and what worked in, in the informal process that there was there. Stan Roth, a lot of you know Stan Roth. He was doing a lot of summertime work out in Western Kansas. So he had a lot of good information. And then there were individual birders. In the late 80s, early 90s, I was challenged to start keeping county lists by Dan Lachelle, by Scott Feltman, probably Pete Jansen too. So I mean, we, Individually, we had this information. Then in 1992 and 90 through 97, after Birds in Kansas was published, we had the data collection for the Kansas Breeding Bird Atlas, which took us into a lot of parts of Kansas where we hadn't birded before. So we were starting to get that collection in. Well, about the same time in the 90s, I was getting asked by different extension offices across the state if I would come and do programs on backyard bird feeding, bird watching in general, just the basic kind of stuff. And I said, sure, I'll do that. One question I was asked every single time. Well, I look at these bird books. Is there a list of just the birds that are in Wilson County, in Clay County, in Lincoln County? And I'd say, no, there isn't. But I got to thinking about that. And so I started talking to Max. And in 1999, I started the process of 
Max, send me your records. Give me a printout for every county, for site records, for breeding records. He got me about a third of the counties, and he had the audacity to go to Australia for, I don't know, six or nine months on sabbatical. So I had to wait until he got back so I could pick up the project. October 6, 2001, KOS Fall Meeting. In this very auditorium, I give a program on the Kansas County Checklist Project, a momentary lapse of reason. <laughs> that has now gone on for about 25 years. I had the checklist all done, the first set of checklists. I had 50 CDs up here on the table. And he said that I was the program before break. And I said, here they are. Come and get a CD. The only cost is you've got to send me your records. At that time, well, then a couple months later, a couple weeks later, we got them all up on the ksbirds.org uh, website, which was less than a couple years old. It hadn't been around very long. The original set of checklists had 23,519 county species. So an American robin in three counties is three county species. American robins have been seen in all 105 counties, trust me. We are now, as of late, as the end of March is my last set of updates, 30,268 species. And my next update list, I've already got five species on there. 15 counties had 300 or more species. That's now 39. 40 counties, over a third of the counties, had less than 200 species on their checklist. We now have no counties with less than 200 species on their checklist. And the records started pouring in. I mean, I would get updates for three or four counties and I'd update that checklist right away. And I very quickly realized that was gonna drive me crazy. So I started collecting them and doing them. At first I was doing them three times a year. Now I'm doing them usually twice a year. Sometimes it gets kind of crazy, so I only can do them once a year. This was the map that I showed. Anything in red had less than 200 species. Anything in yellow was 201 to 299, or 200 to 299, and anything in green was over 300. And my motto was, let's get the red out. Now, there were birders, experienced birders, that were looking at that and looking at me going, Chuck, you'll never find 200 species in Wichita County. It's impossible. And I said, maybe so, but let's try. This is the most current version of that map. The red is gone. Yellow is now for anything from, well, orange is 200 to 249, yellow is 250 to 299, green is 300 to 349, and blue is over 350. We made great progress. On the left was the top few counties in 2001, on the right are the top few counties now. Sedgwick is still at the top of the list. But since 2001, you've added 22 new species to the county checklist. The, you know, Bart, Barton and Morton sit there and kind of fight back and forth to see who's going to be number two and three. Douglas hangs in there, and it's just absolutely fascinating. Okay, what's on the other end? Well, I used to call the wall of shame. Greeley had 114 species. 114 species. Today, they're at double that. So there's been big progress made. Eventually, I have no doubt, we will get every ca county over 250, just because we've got people out there. What does it take for a big county list? Well, you gotta have birds. I mean, you gotta have habitat. Variety of habitats is helpful. You gotta have birders, and you gotta have access to the records. Look at those counties in green. And you can probably start to name names of birders or institutions or Wichita Audubon. Collections of people and the records could go with them. And let's look at some of those counties in red. Okay, we had Kansas Green Bird Atlas that was, were at all 105 counties in the 90s. But when were they there? May, June, July, maybe August. Was anybody going to Greeley County in the middle of December or January or February looking for long spurs, looking for golden crown and kinglets, things like that? They just weren't going after. 
So where we are now, Tansford Records Committee is still going on. That's a lot of the big records. Or that number on Wichita, on the Sedgwick County, does not include the Rosie Finch. I'm waiting for KBOC to act on that. We have still have indiv individual birders records. Now we have eBird. And we have social media. We have iNatural. We've got all sorts of different ways to get it. The county checklist project started before eBird became a thing. eBird got organized around 2002. Kansas birders started joining, really joining in mass, 2008, 2010. Kevin, you may have been one of the first ones on eBird. I think you may go back to 2005. I'm not sure. I was looking at some of those the other day. Prior to eBird, 100% of the records, the new records, were being sent directly to me. Now, that's less than 20%. Some people put it on eBird, but they also send me a notice so I don't have to fish through it. I sit down every day, look at that eBird rarity report, and look for new records, and that's fine for rarities, but some of the routine stuff, and there's still a lot of counties missing routine stuff, doesn't show up, because it's not a rarity. eBird is based on hotspots. That's just the way that they're doing it, and I totally understand why. County checklists are based on a county. Maybe a bunch of different hotspots they do. Sometimes hotspots overlap. Mike Rader and I were just working on some potential new records from Rice County. Well, it was just across the line. They were actually in Stafford County is where they saw the bird. So that didn't necessarily count. Um, county checklists also have historical records that may or may not be in eBird. Specimens in museums, egg collections, and these are routinely getting updated in, what is that, BurtNet or something like that. Max Thompson, bless his heart, is still going through couple times a year and looking for new records that we don't have already. He sent me a bunch of egg collection stuff a couple of years ago. eBird is getting to the point now because we, we started along with you know a few records coming in, a few people putting in historical records, and now in the past 10, 15 years they're really starting to explode. So we're starting to get enough information that we can start to do something with it. It's hard to go back very far in the past though for a comparison because we just don't have the data there. Wild cards. Birding is a hobby. Ornithology is a science. And throughout history, hobby and science occasionally have head-on collisions at about 90 miles an hour. And somebody submits a record, it isn't accepted, their feelings are hurt, and they're never going to submit another record. It's happened in Kansas, it's happened across the country, around the world. So that just, that happens. Digital photography has helped. 20 years ago, there were probably less than a fourth of the uh, Bird Records Committee rare bird reports came in with photos. Now it's over three-fourths of them come with photos. Because everybody's got a cell phone and even a poor photo can help. KBRC members, Kansas Bird Records Committee members are also eBird reviewers. Not all of them. Thank God I'm not. I don't want that job. Um, and so there's a constant give and take of information. We're getting information passed back and forth. County listings. The one thing that I did not expect was the competitive nature of many of us birders. <laughs> and county listing got started, not by me. Who was that, Pete? Lisa Edwards? Pete? Yeah, Lisa Edwards, she's in New Mexico now, I think. Anyway, she, she asked me, she said, what do you think? I said, sure, what the heck? Oh my goodness gracious. I had no idea that there were, there were people like Henry Armsnick out there who has just ridiculous amounts of time and, and records. So that helped generate a majority of these records. I'll be right on. Digital photography, and not just digital photography, but the improvements in in glass, not only in camera lenses, but in our optics, the knowledge of birders, the specialty bird books that have come out, have just exploded what we know about bird plumages. Collection still happens, collection still needs to happen. DNA work is, is the next, uh, next revolution that's happening. Improved uh, cell phones. 
without, I mean, prior to cell phones, you went birding, you saw a rare bird, you went home, you called the rare bird alert, Scott Tillman listened to it, he waded through everything, posted it once, maybe twice a week on the, on the tape recorder so you could call it up and listen. With cell phones, Steve Seibel can see a four-tailed flycatcher in Reno County. Take a picture off the back of this camera, text it to, to Max Thompson. Max Thompson can call me and send me the photo and say, look what just showed up in Reno County. I can call Mike Rader, who I talked to earlier in the day, and said, Mike, you're going to make a detour, and here's why. You know, the ability to get reports of rare birds out so much quicker is just phenomenal. Uh, the field guide app, I'm never without my phone, so I'm never without my Sibley. Merlin, it's a tool, but it's not perfect. I don't know how many times it has been calling Harris the Sparrows the Spring at our farm, white-throated sparrows on a regular basis. I get to see a white throated sparrow out there this spring. And then just to increase the interest in birding, it really started 20 years ago. It really started, I think, when the pandemic hit. It got really turbocharged because people found something safe they could do, and they felt safe doing it, and they were still outside with nature. Well then, and I don't have pins, I don't have the original Guide to Kent's Birds and Birding Hotspots, but this came out in two th May 2011, it took us a whole lot of our time, didn't it, Bob? It ate four years of my time working on that. But then we have Kansas Pacific Range Map, overlaid with where we had county records, open circles being an indication of breeding, the, the solid circles just a site record. I caught flack about that. They said, well, that's backwards. You should be an open circle for a site record and a closed circle, meaning it's been completed for a breeding record. I said, nope. And I did it that way for one reason. Thompson and the Elite Birds in Kansas used that same, same format. So I just kept going forward with it. So I won't make you guess which species those are because I can only remember one of the three. Okay, county checklists are a presence absence test. Has the bird been seen in this county or not? Not how many times has it been seen there, not how many of them have been seen there. It's not going to talk about species density. That's just a flaw. You need things like long-term e-bird records to do that. BB, breeding bird survey data. Christmas bird count data. And I'm going to show you some Christmas bird count data that's rather depressing towards the end of my talk. Range retractions are hard to measure. We were talking, several of us, at dinner tonight about Incadum. Last Inca does were found in 33 counties, confirmed breeding record in one county. Last record for Kansas, confirmed record was 2008. Floated and disappeared. Will Lincolns do the same thing? We don't know. That's why we keep track of the records. The range expansion is when a, a species that had never been in the state starts occurring in the state, or when a species that had been rare starts becoming less rare. Quite simply. Um, Early on with the checklist, we were simply filling in data gaps. We were filling in data gaps because birders were going to areas that hadn't been birded before. One of the fluke things that happened was I kept track of when species were added to the county checklist. Didn't matter when the bird was sighted, it may have been decades earlier. I just added black crown and yellow crown night heron to the Franklin County list in this last round of updates. Those records go back to the 19th, to the 19th century, 1880s. Just some data that somebody came across. I think it was from Chapman data, Frank Chapman. Um, so what we are to the point now that I think we can compare RE versus EDC. Range expansion versus enhanced birder coverage. And I think we've got a great example of that. Golden Crown Kingland. That's a map that was in Thompson in Birds in Kansas, Thompson and Ely. Now, does anybody think that those western counties prior to Thompson and Ely didn't have Golden Crown Kingland? No. It's just who was out in Greeley County in December hanging around the cemetery is looking for it. Because they're going to be around the evergreen trees. We're now down to two counties that don't have Golden Crown Kingland because we've got people going out throughout the year. 
not just in the breeding season with breeding bird surveys, not just at Christmas bird count. They're going out in January and February and March. You've got more birders, but you've got better communication. Now, for a lot of the rest of my program, we're going to be talking about range maps. Just looking at what has happened, because now we have Thompson Ely with 1989, 1992, so basically 30-some years ago, as our baseline. So in the 30, 35 years, what has happened? The Arabian collar duck. First one wasn't found until 1996. Everybody was looking down here, and I probably have a pointer on this if I can find it. Everybody was looking down in, you know, south, they're coming up from Florida. So everybody was looking down in southeast Kansas. Where was the first Eurasian collared duck found in Kansas? Goodland. How the heck did it get to Goodland first? I don't know. But, so it was in Thompson and Ely. First set of county checklists. We already had a breeding record in Meade County. And today, it's really funny you can get the zoom through and just boom, boom, boom. There, there they go. A lot more breeding. And they're breeding in a lot more counties than what we show here. But who's going out and looking for Eurasian collared dove next? When we started the Kansas Breeding, uh, the KBAT Kansas Breeding Bird Atlas, do you know how many counties in Kansas did not have house sparrow nesting records? A lot. White winged duck, Thompson Ely, rare, a vagrant, four counties. That's what it is today. The yellow counties were the ones that had breeding records in 2011 for, for birds in Kansas. And you can see how many more breeding counties of breeding records we have now. Is just a handful of counties that do not have white and dove records. I could sit, I'd sit down and start doing these maps for the past several weeks, and I just get so engrossed in it because it's just absolutely fascinating going back and recreating the maps between Thompson and Ely and all these. Barred out. Now, Thompson and Ely did not have breeding, uh, counties with breeding records in the case for whatever reason. But Max had the data, so I could I went back and did, and I've got a couple others I should have been on. But this, I meant Barn Owl, Thompson Ely from 1989. We know it likes the, the old riparian woodland area, kind of the woodland version of the great horned owl. So I mean, they're where we were expecting to be. 2010 and today. Friends of the Kansas Forest Service talk about, GIS guys, about how much more woodland area we have in Kansas now than we did 30, 40, 50 years ago. And this is in addition to the cedar trees. That's a different issue. But riparian woodlands are increasing and aging across the state. So here's a species that is responding to that. Yeah, there's going to be some gaps in the data, but if you go back, you know, Scott Seltman was living in Pawnee and Rush County. If you know Scott Seltman, you, you know that if there would have been barred owls there in 1989, he would have known it and he would have reported it. Mike Rader was up in, um, what, Russell and Ellsworth County. Same thing. Man's got radar ears. So these weren't just filling in the gaps. This was range expansion. Red-shouldered hawk. I need to go back and get the, the breeding records from from Max for Thompson Neely. But another another species that was that is tightly affiliated with those riparian areas along rivers, along creeks, along streams. Thompson Neely, first set of county checklist, and today. Now that's that's the um, range map that's in Birds of Kansas. If I were to update that map. That range, all that yellow would be purple, and about two to three counties on past that would be yellow. Yellow meaning it's migratory. See it occasionally, but the purple means it's a year round resident. They're moving on down those streams and rivers too. Pillated woodpeckers. You go back to the 60s and, and early 60s, I wasn't here birding then, Max told me. You want to see a pillated woodpecker, you went to Lynn County. That's where they were, Thompson Neely, 2001, the first set of checklists, and today. 
They are nesting clear out of Quadrilla National Wildlife Refuge. The nesting in Missouri County, I just can't find a darn nest. <laughs> Truthy. You go to Walla Walla Road, you go up to the East Bridge, and, and there's a there's a draw that goes up there, and they are always up there. They're nesting. I know they are. You just gotta get up there and find them. Fish crow. My first, Jason, my first KOF spring meeting was down at Pittsburgh, which I remember the date, and we got to go down to Chesapeake County and see fish crows in Kansas. It was amazing. They were nesting down there already by then. 2001, we're going out a little bit more. Today, nesting record from Lindsborg, McPherson County. Again, they're nesting a lot more cattle. The crows have this bad habit that when they're nesting, they shut up. It's the only time they shut up. <laughs> I was in Junction City yesterday, walked out of the hardware store, and a flock of five fish crows went over tall. And I just stopped right in the middle of the, of the driveway and looking up at him. I'm surprised I didn't get hit. Okay. Some other species are kind of fun to see what's going on. Black capped chicken, Thompson Neely. Now by the second second volume, um, they were putting the breeding records in. So this is right out of the book. Not down in southeast Kansas. We know that. But you look at that map and you go, there's a lot more breeding records there than that. Well, who's been out looking for black cap chickadee now? We had the Kansas Breeding Bird Atlas Project, and that filled in a lot of those gaps. I will be surprised if we ever find them in Cherokee County. Um, LaBette, Montgomery County, they're not common there. But we do have at least one confirmed record. Least flycatcher. This one blew my mind when I was working on this map. Least flycatcher is not one of those western pigments. It's, it's what I consider an eastern, a semi US eastern and pigment. And yet, look in Thompson Neely what the record. Why Central County doesn't have a dot, I don't know. I went back and checked. And they just hadn't been reported from there. Western Kansas is covered. Eastern Kansas has a lot of gaps. Not anymore. We have records from all 105 counties. There are things that are happening with the bird populations and distributions that just are going to puzzle me until I die. The Langley Bunny, we have nesting records from Morton County. I don't think I have that map in here. From Morton County. And that's the only place to nest in the state. So they're a western species. And yet in migration, they'll show up all over this stinking place. I don't know. Dusty Flycatcher is one of those western infants. Had five counties in Thompson Neely. I mean, that's a case of we simply have a little better handle. I don't know that they're expanding that much, but we have a better handle on where they, where they are and regularly should be in the state. Yellow throated vireo, another woodland species, loves to be on that riparian timber. Thompson Neely, you know, we, we know it's a vagrant, it'll go all over the place throughout the western US in migration. That's what we have for record. Today, following along a lot of those woodland riparian areas. If you have, if you want to maybe back up to something or you have a question, just raise your hand. You know, I'm, I'm to that age to where if I'm sitting out there and the question gets into my mind, I've got about a 20 second window of opportunity and then it's gone. <laughs> so, th so don't let that happen to you. Just shout out and I'll stop and go back. Northern Parallel, uh, another. What, where do they like to, they love those sycamore trees. Where do you find the sycamore trees? Along the rivers, along the streams. When I'm talking to new birders, I, I tell them. Many species of birds are inextricably tied to certain vegetation. Learn what that is, and you can go any place and you can figure out where you had a chance to find it. So they, they love those sycamore trees. And Thompson Neely, yeah, about what you might expect. Look at that today. Nest that's hard to find. That's why they're not bring ready for Gary County yet. Chesapeake Sided Warbler, I, I looked at this map, putting it together, and I thought, yeah, I really thought, that, that's one that in the spring, especially in, in South Bend migration, I always seem to think it's you know, pretty obvious, but prior to 92, we didn't have a record in Gary County. Probably a little bit better representation of it. Has it expanded that much in the state? No, I think the birders have expanded that much in the state. 
I just love the warblers of the great show. Blackbird green warbler, Thompson Neely. One that in the fall, my gosh, they're everywhere. Golden-winged warbler is one that I always associate, man. That's one of those eastern hot warblers, man. It's great. Want to find that one? Man, I, I, that Geary County record is not mine. Don't know that I have one. Ah, I do have one in Geary County now. But now look at it. The Dickinson County record, Jay and I were down at Rock Springs Ranch, Rustin 4-H camp. About 100 feet into the town, there's a low water crossing where you go in. And there were three up in the oak trees. All the time we've seen them there. Yellow throated warbler. Another bird that is associated with sycamores, right, Pete? Yes, sir. Another one that I'll bet you it's missing a lot more counties than that. Pine warbler. This is when I was looking at it. It, it really surprised me at, at Thompson Neely's book because that's one that we we see or hear every single fall. Go to a cemetery that's got a lot of evergreens in it, pine trees, and you're probably going to find one in October, early November. And Thompson and Neely, today. Palm warbler. I was surprised we had that many more palm warblers than pine warblers. Louisiana water throat. This is another one that I think could very easily be following the riparian corridor because they are the water throat associated with springs, running water. And today, I've got to figure out how to find a nest of one because they're always on the, the creek that's always running in Walla Walla Road. They're up on Fort Riley. The Pet Cemetery Trail, I've just got to find a nest. Summer Tanager. When I first came here in, to Kansas in 82, man, summer tanagers were not commonly found. Jay and I started dating in 1983, got married, and went out to the farm where she grew up. I go out, and there were no summer tanagers there. We live at that farm now, and they are nesting in the yard. So they are expanding their range. The populations are diving, but they're expanding their range. Eastern Phoebe. Kansas is basically a two Phoebe state. You've got Eastern Phoebe's in the east. Save Phoebe's in the West. Never the twain shall meet. Well, not quite. Thompson and Neely's got a lot of blanks there and a lot of non breeding cattle. And yet, it's probably there. So, between Thompson and Neely and the first set of the county checklist, we had the Kansas Pretty Bird Atlas Project. Took care of a lot of those baby counties. Then you go to Birds of Kansas. And look what's happening. Breeding records are moving west. And today, are they displacing save Phoebe? We need John Shepard here to answer that question. I don't know. What I do know is, would somebody please go to Labette County and start looking underneath every single bridge for a nest of eastern Phoebe? <laughs> Kevin, that's a good job for you. Uh, we'll put Andrew on. <laughs> okay, we'll put Andrew on that. Good idea. There we go. And that's just the ironic thing that happens with these records. Really, Labette County without a breeding record? Oh my gosh. Okay, let's get into some more recent ones. Black bellied whispering duck. Thompson and Neely, three counties. A rarity. By the first set of county checklist, five counties. I, Jay and I saw the one in Saline County. It was at a pond and a housing development. It was there for a week. I thought, wow, how cool is that? Birds, in Ca Birds of Kansas, 2011. Okay, is something going on here? Oops. <laughs> Got something down here. Oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so the lights are gone out. Yeah, something was happening. It did, we have now added the next set of checklists. We'll have a dot in Kiowa County. That record just came in this week. Was that one of the military I think. So I mean, it's, I've got five ponds in Gary County I'm watching, still haven't had one show up there. But they're exploding. Was it similar to what you saw last week? Yes, I saw the picture today. In different places? In different places. 
What's going on? We don't know. But I mean, it's, it's not just Kansas, it's Oklahoma too. Lincoln. I'll show you one map for Lincoln. Because three years ago, it wasn't even in the state. Two years ago at this time, it wasn't even in the state that we knew of. We knew that it was coming, or suspected that it would get here. And boy, did it ever. The Bird Records Committee is still taking records on this. And this is one, for the records accepted in 2023, half of those were not records that were submitted. They were just pulled off of eBird because they had good pictures to go with them. Is it going to continue? That's why we're still keeping track of them. We don't know. But boy, Bob, they'll take some of those big old Navy clams and tear them up, won't they? <laughs> Bob and I watched one down at Deary State Fishing Lake just had to that big and just went after it. So much fun. Great black bass gull. And I could think of another hundred species that we could look at that to me are just still fascinating. And Thompson Ely, one record, Cheyenne Bottom, hypothetical, no photograph, no specimen, nothing. And today, maybe not seeing a lot of them every winter, but most winters are going to have several around. Lesserback bat gull was not in Thompson and Ely, first in Kansas. First one wasn't found until 1996. Max Thompson had it down at Winfield City Lake, Cali County. Hypothetical record, no photo. And we all know what they've done all across the country. So we got them today. Possibly nesting at Cheyenne Bottom. We don't know. Maybe. It comes down to having access to records. We need the habitat for the birds. We need the birders. We need access to the records. eBird has done that in a just incredibly well. Social media has been a two-edged sword. You wouldn't believe the places that some of the folks that help me track all this have pulled records out of, off of Facebook, off of I can remember some of those social media, you know, Twitter, X. I'm sorry, it's X now, it's not Twitter. Um, and it's uh, sorting through it sometimes is a challenge. Malcolm Goldwood, through some of my naturalist records, found four unknown records of hooded orioles in Kansas. Okay, two of those were put in with the wrong coordinates. They were not Kansas. The other two were trying to get more details on. That would double the number of known records we have. Ebert is a data monster at times. There's a lot of incredibly good information in there but going through it and filtering it out can drive you to drink. It's much easier to track range expansion and range retraction. It's like first of season first. We all know, oh yeah, I saw my first bird on such and such, a first chimney switch on April 15th. When did you see your last one last year? Um, I'm not sure. First of season is always easier to track than last of season eBird is a big help in that. So expansion and retraction, it can be a challenge. We've added almost 6,800 records, county records. And yet, a lot of those species that we're reporting from across the state are species that are dropping in population precipitously. Probably should throw in the greater lesser prey chickens because those are two where the ranges are shifting. They are shifting. The past 25 years, and I'll be doing this for many, many more years, I hope, because I'm just absolutely fascinated by it. We're simply getting a better understanding of where the birds have been seen in the state. What's happening with the ranges? Stay tuned. You'll find out. A couple of species that are of concern of mine, chickadees and magpies. In 2001 or two, early 2000s, West Nile virus hit the state. Made people sick, killed some people, but it was devastating on certain groups of birds. The parrots, the chickadees, very susceptible to it. The corvids, very susceptible to it. Blue jays, crows, numbers went down, went right back up. Magpies, not so much. 
So one of the things I started working at about 10 years after West Melbourne came into the state was how many chickadees are we seeing on Christmas bird counts? Now, the number of people involved in Christmas bird counts every year changes in the state. The number of counts that we do in the state changes. You know, I could go through and try to pick out, well, certain counts are held every year regardless. But what we do is simply we use a smoothing mechanism called species per party average. It's kind of an average that tries to level everything out. And I sat down and I, I pulled the records out and looked at how many party hours we had and how many total individuals. And I came up with how many species. So starting with chickadees, 1991 through, originally through 2012, I have continued it on. And there's a little red dots up here. Those are the pre-West Nile virus average. And then the lower dotted line, lower line there, the green line, I think that's green, um, is post-West Nile. What happened from 92 to 97? I don't know. But I know what happened on the next drop. That was West Nile virus. And chickadees that now I've combined Carolina and black activities here. Didn't try to separate them out. Some years there might have even been a few mountain chickadees in there. I'm not sure. But I sat and I watched that. I've got a good graduate school buddy that's some endowed chair of biostatistics at Clemson. I sent him the data and I said, is there a way to see if this is significantly different? He said, oh yeah, we can do that. And he sent me an email back and he said, yeah, there's a significant difference there. It's very significant. I got a 0.99 level. So then I got to thinking, okay, what happened prior to 91? Was data going up and then coming back down? Was our rate coming down to an even higher level? So a couple months ago, I sat down and I took it back to 1971. Why 1971? Well, it's a nice round number, 20 years. But prior to 71, the number of Christmas bird counts in Kansas was quite a bit lower. Um, you get back into the 60s and, and some of the standards weren't being that some counts weren't doing the 15 miles. So, so there was a lot of, 71 were okay. Prior to that, it gets a little bit shaky. So I went back another 20 years. And the chickadee numbers have been all over the board. They had even been higher. It's a five and a half chickadees per party hour. Good numbers of chickadees. A lot of variability. A lot of bouncing around there in that 71 to 91 period. Like I said, the data prior to 71 gets really messy. So I was just looking at this. I still don't know what happened just prior to West Nile virus, but there's that. Now magpies. Black-billed magpie for decades was moving east across the state. We had nesting records as far east as Northern Wiley County, Marshall County. We were getting them in Jerry County every Christmas on Wakefield and Jim City Christmas Bird Camp. They were doing well. Then West Nile virus came in. I just want to look at that and soak it up for a few minutes. 2023, the Christmas bird camp season just ended. A low, low number way over there. They were fine on five Christmas bird counts. And granted, we don't have as many out west. With those five counts, 75% of the birds were on one count. The yellow-billed magpie in California is in even worse shape. That bird may be on the way to extinction. So that one just depresses the heck out of me. Okay, wrapping up now. All of this that I've shown you is only possible because of birders sharing their records. And that is important. There's a lot more we need to do. MODIS is the next technology. For those not familiar with MODIS, it allows their towers, <coughs> receiving towers, that can record data from chips that are placed on the backs of birds. They can use them on almost any species that's large enough to carry, but even small birds can carry it. And so you don't have to see them. You can simply monitor the data, and they're logged in. They've got unique IDs. 
that's the tip of the iceberg. I have no idea where that's going to go. But anyway, there we go. So I sleep. We're keen to make those records. There is so much information we need to know yet that we want to know. And, and try to really work on it. So questions? Okay, back here first in bunk. Not by me. <laughs> they are doing that in some things. Um, the, what was it? Several years ago, they they said 75 uh, 25 percent of the bird species, the birds are gone from 1970 to today. One in four is gone, and they even have broken down by um, by different groups. They're doing that. That's really high level stuff. This whole entire time we've been doing that. But I mean, I, I'm hoping I can do some of the expansion of the riparian timber with a GIS folks at the Kansas Forest Service to try to do some correlations there. But there, that's one of those intangibles when I talk to people about, you know, a tangible form of bird loss is something that you can observe and count like a cat. That's tangible. The intangible is the impact of microplastics, the impact of climate, climate change. We know that black cap chickadees are regressing in their range, and Carolina chickadees are moving further north because they're more adapted to their warmer temperatures. We're watching that happen. So it's there. It's an impact, and people are trying to quantify that with the data. Kansas was the And, and that's where, you know, I'm getting ready to work on a project that you challenged me on, and that's to do by family group distribution when our birds in the thick, when new chicken sprayers arrive from the babies, that kind of thing. And I'm going to re reply he rely heavily on eBird for that. But I think, I mean, breeding bird survey data is good, solid information. Um, we got a bunch of vacant routes, by the way, in Kansas, if anybody was interested. Um, Dan Michelle passed away, he did at least nine routes. Um, I think eBird's going to provide a lot of that, and I think that was one of the reasons they started it, was so they could start to get that kind of data and also, through their hotspot techniques, identify critical areas. But yeah, it's very limited. It may have already reached the end of its lifespan except for the new species that we're adding in. But I'll keep doing it. <laughs> Somebody once said, well, second rate, you're going to be, you're going to have, you know, every species in all 105 counties and you're going to know you're not. That won't happen. So, yeah, I think eBird is going to be a lot of, we, we're going to rely on eBird a lot for that. And I think there's a lot of people that are going to be doing a lot of really interesting work with that data. Yes, ma'am. They are all over the country. I think they're even all over the world. It's an international thing. You can go to modus.com. Um, anybody, I, I, I know there's at least six or eight. KOS paid to have one go in um, over a but near Emporia. We installed one at Chapman Mason. Yes. Yeah. And there's one up at Conza Prairie. There's one at Cheyenne Bottom. Yeah, I know there's a lot of giant bottoms, so 
we want to make the concurrency one in our um, and, and if we need to have internet access, we have power. It's about seven to eight thousand dollars to get one up and running and to maintain it for a couple of years. So it's it's expensive, but it's not outrageous. And, and that I mean, then we use it to track small mammals, to track reptiles, amphibians. It's just absolutely amazing what we can do with that technology. Ours is fairly young, but we've had two spring snippets <coughs> and a Franklin gill. Yeah. So. I, I'm just now starting to go in and try to figure out how to get the data out of it. But it's it's basically out there. You just got to. Somebody said somebody was commenting on on that. So I know by Pottawatomie County, and he said, "Well, it's not intuitive. Just sit in there and play for a while. You'll figure it out." But I think that's the thing that nobody has to see it. Just simply the birds flying over, it'll pick up the, the radio telemetry clip. And it will tell you where the bird was originally tagged, where it was. I mean, and there's so much data that you can pull off of that. So you get a better idea. Yeah. You said it was seven or eight thousand for putting it out there. You said monitoring. A couple thousand dollars for maintaining it for years. It'll keep going. They'll just have to find the money someplace. So there, it's electronic equipment and electronic equipment essentially breaks. Imagine that, and needs to be replaced. Just things like that. Is it tough by all? Oh sure. It's a metal tower into the ground. There was a dent that it, at some point could have struck a light. I'm running. I'm, I'm a ham radio operator. Trust me, lightning will find a way to get everything. <laughs> If it's in the air and it's metal, <laughs> don't get struck. What does the bird have to do with the tower? I'm not sure how close it has to be. Do you? Uh, I think it's um, as far as 20 miles. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. It depends on the elevation Terrain. and how many trees and all sorts of things. But I think the farthest is about 20 miles. There are two different technologies. And so <coughs> you'll see on the tower, there's two different antennas. And one is like about 10 miles, and the other one's about 20 miles. So I, I, I'm excited to get in and start looking at the data. See how many new kinds of records I can get. Yeah. Now, now if it flies over the airspace, does it take? No, I'm good with that. I'm just wondering <laughs> who's tagging Franklin for us. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody that had. It's it's not a perfect. It's kind of like Merlin. It ain't perfect yet. There was somebody. What was it that? John Schiffman had a summer tanager oh, yeah. that hit the tower at Fort Leavenworth, up by Kansas City. And it had been it had been reported from down in Columbia a week before. We started digging into it. The same bird had been in British Columbia and a week later was in Newfoundland. <laughs> so there's something not right there. <laughs> I think there's a faulty tag on that bird. <laughs> Because that's really a kind of a convoluted trap, even for a tanager. Other questions? It's, it's human assisted, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> that's a possibility. If you're a birder and you're not reporting to eBird, those maps at ksbirds.org, the county checklist project, you can find the checklist for all 105 counties. You can find the individual species dot maps like I was showing you. Um, if you've got a record for a bird that I don't have on the county checklist, send it to me. If you're a, if you're an eBird, I'll pick it up off of that eventually. So, yes. I'm going to look after Merlin. I enjoy my Merlin when I go for a walk. So <laughs> I'll look after it too. Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't really use it much, but it's pretty good. But there are some things that trip it up. I think one of the big things uh, around these parts would have to do with Carolina chickadees versus black cat chickadees. Because mm -hmm. that's a difficult one to, to separate sort out. out. Yeah. And Merlin, I would say, probably makes quite a few mistakes on that one. But it's pretty good. It, it, it's pretty good. But there are, there are birds that have
some of them are is, some of them are really really accurate. I mean, it's not like these have been shooting bullets all day. But uh, black rails flying over at night, I believe, <laughs> maybe. But I, I feel that it's ninety to ninety five percent accurate. But even if you read the information I just said, you need to follow this up with visual observation, especially at rare species. It will ta tell you something that things is out of out of place. If you pull up a mockingbird at our at our house, and we don't have a mockingbird around here, <laughs> but it's here in the Carolina Rim, it won't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So it and, and it's also we we like it when we're going on trips and we're out of our area because it cues us in to oh it helps it helps us find mocking sparrows in North Carolina. Mocking yeah. In North Carolina. Sorry, I didn't think any species I just said. Um, that's a good quote. <laughs> um, so it's like, okay, it's here. Let's find it now, and you can play back and listen to it. So it, it is a tool, but boy, it, use it cautiously. Thank you. 